Hello there. Hello, Mel, Patty, Gina. Those are the names I saw before I uh, left the camera and, uh, and assumed the position. Uh, I hope you're all very well. I hope everyone is well. My name is Gilded, and I have been doing these fireside readings since very early on in the coronavirus lockdown. And um, we've read several books. And now we're reading a book called The Inimitable Jeeves. It's a book of, uh, effectively a book of short stories. Uh, it was sort of put together by P.G. Woodhouse, who wrote all of the Jeeves and Wooster novels. Uh, and it cobbled together some of the short stories he'd written uh, and uh, made a sort of narrative of them. But effectively, they're short stories. Um, so they're pretty discreet, unless they go from chapter to chapter, in which case I'll tell you what happened in the previous one. But this one sort of starts a new one. Um, so, welcome to a fireside reading of the inimitable Jeeves, chapter three. Aunt Agatha speaks her mind. I suppose in the case of a chappy of really fine fiber and all that, of sort of thing, a certain amount of gloom and anguish would have followed this dishing of young Bingo's matrimonial plans. I mean, if mine had been a noble nature, I would have been all broken up. But what with one thing and another, I can't say I let it weigh on me very heavily. The fact that less than a week after he had had the bad news, I came on young Bingo dancing like an untamed gazelle at Ciro's helped me to bear up. Resilient bird, Bingo. He may be down, but he is never out. While these little love affairs of his are actually on, nobody could be more earnest and blighted. But once the fuse has blown out and the girl has handed him his hat and begged him as a favour never to let her see him again, up he bobs as merry and bright as ever. If I've seen it happen once, I've seen it happen a dozen times. So I didn't worry about bingo or about anything else. As a matter of fact, what with one thing and another, I can't remember ever having been chirpier than at about this period in my career. Everything seemed to be going right on three separate occasions Horses, on which I'd invested a sizable amount, won by lengths instead of sitting down to rest in the middle of the race, as horses usually do when I've got money on them. Added to this, the weather continued topping to a degree. My new socks were admitted on all sides to be just the kind of thing that mother makes, and to round it all off, my aunt Agatha had gone to France and wouldn't be on hand to snooter me for at least another six weeks. And if you knew my Aunt Agatha, you'd agree that that alone was happiness enough for anyone. It suddenly struck me so forcibly one morning while I was having my bath that I hadn't a worry on earth that I began to sing like a bally nightingale as I sploshed the sponge about. It seemed to me that everything was absolutely for the best in the best of all possible worlds. <sighs> but have you ever noticed a rummy thing about life? I mean, the way something always comes along to give it to you in the neck at the very moment when you're feeling most braced about things in general. No sooner had I dried the old limbs and shoved on the suiting and toddled into the sitting room than the blow fell. There was a letter from Aunt Agatha on the mantelpiece. Oh gosh, I said as I read it. 
sir, said Jeeves. He was fooling about in the background on some job or other. It's from my Aunt Agatha, Jeeves. Mrs. Gregson, you know? Yes, sir. Ha <laughs> ha! You wouldn't speak in that light, careless tone if you knew what was in it, I said with a hollow, mirthless laugh. The curse has come upon us, Jeeves. She wants me to go and join her at, what's the name of the dash place, at Roville sur mer Oh, hang it all! I had better be packing, sir. I suppose so. Do people who don't know my Aunt Agatha, I find it extraordinarily difficult to explain why it is that she's always put the wind up me to such a frightful extent. I mean, I'm not dependent on her financially or anything like that. It's simply personality I've come to the conclusion. You see, all through my childhood and when I was a kid at school, she was always able to turn me inside out with a single glance, and I haven't come out from under the influence yet. We run to a height a bit in our family, and there's about five foot nine of Aunt Agatha, topped off with a beaky nose, an eagle eye, and a lot of grey hair, and the general effect is pretty formidable. Anyway, it never even occurred to me for a moment to give her the miss in balk on this occasion, if she said I must go to Roville, it was all over except buying the tickets. What's the idea, Jeeves? I wonder why she wants me. I could not say, sir. Well, it was no good talking about it. The only gleam of consolation, the only bit of blue among the clouds, was the fact that at Roville I should at last be able to wear the rather fruity cummerbund I'd bought six months ago and had never had the nerve to put on. One of those uh, silk contrivances, you know, which you tie around your waist instead of a waistcoat. Something on the order of a sash, only more substantial. I had never been able to muster up the courage to put it on so far, for I knew that there would be trouble with Jeeves when I did, it being a pretty brightish scarlet. Still, at a place like Roville, presumably dripping with the gaiety and joie de vivre of France, it seemed to me that something might be done. Roville, which I reached early in the morning after a beastly choppy crossing and a jerky night in the train, is a fairly nifty spot where a chappie without encumbrances in the shape of aunts might spend a somewhat genial week or so. It's like all these French places, mainly sands and hotels and casinos. The hotel, which had had the bad luck to draw Aunt Agatha's custom, was the Splendide. <laughs> and by the time I got there, there wasn't a member of the staff who didn't seem to be feeling it deeply. I sympathised with them. I've had experience of Aunt Agatha at hotels before. Of course, the real rough work was all over when I arrived, but I could tell by the way everyone grovelled before her that she had started by having her first room changed because it hadn't a southern exposure, and her next because it had a creaking wardrobe, and that she had said her say on the subject of the cooking, the waiting, the chambermaiding, and everything else, with perfect freedom and candour. She had got the whole gang nicely under control by now. The manager, a whiskered cove who looked like a bandit, simply tied himself into knots whenever she looked at him. <laughs> All this triumph had produced a sort of grim geniality in her, and she was almost motherly when she met me. I am so glad you were able to come, Batte, she said. The air will do you so much good. Far better for you than spending your time in stuffy London nightclubs. Oh. Ah, oh, I said. You will meet some pleasant people, too. I want to introduce you to a Miss Hemingway and her brother, who have become great friends of mine. 
I am sure you will like Miss Hemingway. A nice, quiet girl. So different from so many of the bold girls one meets in London nowadays. Her brother is curate at Chipley in the Glen in Dorsetshire. He tells me they are connected with the Kent Hemingways. A very good family. She is a charming girl. I had a grim foreboding of an awful doom. All this boosting was so unlike Aunt Agatha, who normally is one of the most celebrated right and left hand knockers in London society. I felt a clammy suspicion, and by Jove, I was right. Aline Hemingway, said Aunt Agatha, is just the girl I should like to see you marry, Bertie. You ought to be thinking of getting married. Marriage might make something of you. And I could not wish you a better wife than dear Aline. <laughs> she would be such a good influence in your life. Here, yeah, I say, I chipped in at this juncture, chilled to the marrow. Bertie, said Aunt Agatha, dropping the motherly manner for a bit and giving me the cold eye. Yes, but uh, I say, it is young men like you, Bertie, who make the person with the future of the race at heart despair. Cursed with too much money, you fritter away in idle selfishness a life which might have been made useful, helpful, and profitable. You do nothing but waste your time on frivolous pleasures. You are simply an antisocial animal, a drone. Bertie, it is imperative that you marry. But dash it all. Yes, you should be breeding children to... No, really, I say please, I said, blushing richly. Aunt Agatha belongs to two or three of these women's clubs, and she keeps forgetting she isn't in the smoking room. Bertie, she resumed, and would no doubt have hauled up her slacks at length, had we not been interrupted. Ah, here they are, she said. Aileen, dear. And I perceived a girl and a chappie bearing down on me, smiling in a pleased sort of manner. I want you to meet my nephew, Bertie Wooster, said Aunt Agatha. He has just arrived. Such a surprise. I had no notion of he intending coming to Roville. I gave the couple the wary up and down, feeling rather like a cat in the middle of a lot of hounds. Sort of a trapped feeling, you know what I mean? An inner voice was whispering that Bertram was up against it. The brother was a small round cove with a face rather like a sheep. He wore pince-nez, his expression was benevolent, and he had on one of those collars which button at the back. Welcome to Roville, Mr Wooster, he said. Oh, Sydney, said the girl. Doesn't Mr. Wooster remind you of Canon Blenkinsop, who came to Chipley to preach last Easter? My dear, the resemblance is most striking. They peered at me for a while as if I were something in a glass case, and I goggled back and had a, a good look at the girl. There's no doubt about it, she was different from what Aunt Agatha had called the bold girls one meets in London nowadays. No bobbed hair and gaspers about her. I don't know when I've met anybody who looked so... Respectable is the only word. She had on a kind of plain dress, and her hair was plain, and her face was sort of mild and saint-like. I don't pretend to be a Sherlock Holmes or anything of that order, but the moment I looked at her, I said to myself, the girl plays the organ in a village church. Well, we gazed at each other for a bit, and there was a certain amount of chit-chat, and then I tore myself away. 
But before I went, I had been booked up to take brother and the girl for a nice drive that afternoon, and the thought of it depressed me to such an extent that I felt there was only one thing to be done. I went straight back to my room, dug out the cummerbund, and draped it around the old tum. I turned round, and Jeeve shied like a startled Mustang. I beg your pardon, sir, he said in a sort of hushed voice. You are surely not proposing to appear in public in that thing. The cummerbund, I said in a careless, debonair way, passing it off. Oh, rather. I should not advise it, sir. Really, I shouldn't. Why not? The effect, sir, is loud in the extreme. I tackled the blighter squarely. I mean to say, nobody knows better than I do that Jeeves is a mastermind and all that, but dash it, a fellow must call his soul his own. You can't be a serf to your valet. Besides, I was feeling pretty low and the cummerbund was the only thing which would cheer me up. You know, the trouble with you, Jeeves, I said, is that you're too... What's the word for it? Too bally insular. You can't realise that you aren't in Piccadilly all the time. In a place like this, a bit of colour and a touch of poetic is expected of you. Why, I've just seen a fellow downstairs in a morning suit of yellow velvet. Nevertheless, sir... Jeeves, I said firmly, my mind is made up. I am feeling a little low, spirited, and need cheering. Besides, what's wrong with it? This cummerbund seems to me to be called for. I consider that it is rather a Spanish effect, a touch of the Hidalgo, sort of a Vicente Blasco, what's his name, stuff. The jolly old Hidalgo off to the bullfight. Very good, sir, said Jeeves coldly. Dashed upsetting, this sort of thing. If there's one thing that gives me the pip, it's unpleasantness in the home. And I could see that relations were going to be pretty fairly strained for a while. And coming on top of Aunt Agatha's bombshell about the Hemingway girl, I don't mind confessing it made me feel more or less as though nobody loved me. The drive that afternoon was about as mouldy as I had expected. The curate chappie prattled on about this and that, the girl admired the view, and I got a headache early in the proceedings, which started at the soles of my feet and got worse all the way up. I tottered back to my room to dress for dinner, feeling like a toad under the harrow. If it hadn't been for that cummerbund business earlier in the day, I could have sobbed on Jeeves's neck, and poured out all my troubles on him. Even as it was, I couldn't keep the thing entirely to myself. I say, Jeeves, I said. Sir. Mix me a, a stiffish brandy and soda. Yes, sir. Stiffish, Jeeves. Not too much soda, but splash the brandy about a bit. Very good, sir. After imbibing, I felt a shade better. Jeeves, I said, sir, I rather fancy I'm in the soup, Jeeves. Indeed, sir. I eyed the man narrowly. Dashed aloof his manner was, still brooding over the cummerbund. Yes, right up to the hocks, I said, suppressing the pride of the Wooster and trying to induce him to be a bit meatier. Have you seen a girl popping about here with a parson brother? Miss Hemingway, sir? Yes, sir. Aunt Agatha wants me to marry her. Indeed, sir. Well, what about it? Sir? I mean, have you anything to suggest? No, sir. The blighter's manner was so cold and unchummy that I bit the bullet 
and had a dash at being airy. Oh, well, <laughs> tra la la, I said. Precisely, sir, said Jeeves. And that was, so to speak, that. Thank you for joining me. I hope this helps, and I look forward to seeing you for the next chapter of The Inimitable Jeeves tomorrow, 5 Pacific. And if you miss anything, it's always on the YouTube channel, Fireside Reading as well. Until the next time, please be very well. Good night. <laughs>